it's celebrating that a person in a, in a, in a culture is willing to move over into a different role mm -hmm. for the good of the team, rather than climbing to a higher level of uh, positional authority. It's sort of, you know, in the world, it's he would be first must be first. So right. I got to climb the corporate. I got to protect my position. It's a dog eat dog world. Right. Whereas we're we want to celebrate people that are serving. So what does it mean to be a leader? Mm -hmm. A Christ like leader gives up uh, even something that, you know, like Jesus left heaven to came, come down and meet a need. You know, we've got one of our executive guys right now who gave up his office. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris gave up his office because we needed an office. So now, even though he should, ha he could have the position and, you know, he could, that's what he cares about. And he's like, how do we as a team help serve those who are serving and elevate people who, who have humility? And so who is it? that has the influence in the church, the one who is the best at what they do or the one who's a servant and it, thinking through those kinds of things. Welcome back to the Church as a Team Sport podcast. I'm Lance Wickton. I'm the Communications Director here at Real Life Ministries. And uh, welcome to this episode. Today we're talking about recruitment and realignment, which is never easy. But I have the pleasure to have Jim Putman, the author of Church as a Team Sport, who I know has been through both things. And we are going to talk to him today about that. Uh, Jim, this reminds me of a story. Uh, we were a church plant uh, we only had enough people to fit in your living room, and we were all there having, um, uh, getting ready to plan our first service, et cetera. And uh, you went around the room, and you gave each person uh, a job, a task to perform, because you knew what was going to be required of us to get off the ground, basically, to do our first service. But what I want to talk about is, as the church grows and new people come into the church, uh, not only does what we're trying to accomplish change because more people is essentially more problems or, mm -hmm. or different problems, mm -hmm. uh, but also some of the people there are as qualified as some of the people coming in. So uh, that that brings us to our question that has come from uh, info at jimputman.com, which is how do you move the people from the chairs they are currently sitting in? Meaning here's somebody that has been in that role and that's their part of the team. And now here's somebody. And now you realize, uh, I mean, if you go, if you go a sports analogy, boy, this person that we just met, I just met, uh, they would make a phenomenal shortstop. And this person actually that has been playing short would be, would make a better right fielder. Right. So, but you have to, but that person's attached to that position. Yeah. They've been doing it. They have ownership. That's their part of the team, right. but they're going to, but they're going to move. You're right. going to have to move them. So yeah, that, that is the story of a church plant, right? First of all, there's some premises. Every person is saved from something for something. Mm -hmm. So God has good works for them to do before time began. It says in Ephesians two. Mm -hmm. um, and as an equipper, your job is to go, uh, I have a team that God has brought and on this team, everybody plays. Uh, you may play one role at one time, but for the betterment of the team, you play a different role at another time. Your value is no different based on which position you play or right. how long you play it. You're a part of the team. And there are times when you are the best we have and you're doing good work and, and it's amazing. But then um, there are times where your season may change. You have different situation you're going through. And especially when you're raising up young people, their passions change. At first, they're like, they, they, they do general ministry, right? Mm -hmm. You think about like uh, Philip. Uh, he starts out taking care of the Greek widows. But as time goes by, now he's going to the Ethiopian eunuch. He's going to Samaria. The roles change. 
And, and so when I think about that, I think, first of all, it's not necessarily about your passion at first. It's about getting you to learn and grow leading or, or serving. And then as time goes by, your season may change. Mm -hmm. Your, what you're gifted at may, may change. You may grow in your giftedness. You're able to lead at this level, but you're not, you know, you're not able to lead at that level or you're, you grow, you lead here and then you go there and then the job of the coach is to get the right people in the right positions so that the team wins. And you're right. Sometimes people get locked into their identity is a specific role. And part of the teaching has to be, no, your identity is your Christ follower, all of equal value. We play different roles. Sometimes we step into a role for a period of time until God brings somebody that's at, that's their passion or they're more gifted at it. And then I move to a different role. And so just setting the, the foundation of, we all play, we do what's needed, and and sometimes we have to move into different roles for the good of the team or our season, and that's just part of how it works. So, it, and it also highlights how important it is to continually build that culture where uh, I am, like like you say, I am not what I do. Right. Uh, my purpose is to serve, not necessarily my purpose is this title or this particular position. And... Um, it's all about the, uh, you know, like we used to say, it's it's not about the name in the back, your name. Mm -hmm. It's the name in the front, which is the name yeah. of the team. I learned this in my wrestling career. My uh, my sophomore year of college, we were wrestling, you know, for the national championship, and it was a it, it, there was a, a weight that I was. I, I was a one sixty seven pounder, but because we had another 167 pounder who could place in the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a 177 pounder. And so I went to 177, even though uh, I could have won the national title personally at 167, I went to 177 because I, I had a good shot at it. Mm -hmm. I end up taking second at 177. Uh, the guy I'd beaten many times before wanted at 167 from another school, but our guy took third at that weight. I took second at the weight above, and we won the national title by two points. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't move up to 177, we don't win the national title, but I personally win a national title. Right. The question is, what's, what's most important, the team win or the personal win? Uh, we talk about church as a team sport. The personal win is... Um, isn't the most important thing. And we live in a culture that says my gifting, my, I, I want to do what I like to do, what I'm passionate about doing at all times. And I don't know how that squares with, uh, you know, you have to take up your cross daily, deny mm -hmm. yourself, right. And follow Jesus. Uh, how does that square with, you know, even all a lot of the gifts analysis are about, you know, what are you passionate about? What are you good at? And somehow that must mean it's your calling. Whereas I'm not, a, I believe God gave gifts to people sure. that they, they, they are better at some things than the other, but we're also told in scripture that it's really, we're not the heroes of the story. It's about Jesus and Jesus steps into gaps and pulls off something with, with people that he wouldn't have been, he'd ordinary unschooled people, right? That, that weren't really skilled at, doing the things that it took to start a movement, but God stepped in, did miraculous things. He got the glory for it. And so we live in a culture right now that says, I have to enjoy it or it can't be God. I have to be good at it. I can't be foolish or look foolish for the glory of God. And scripture says he takes the foolish things of the, of, uh, of the world and they're wise and the wise things in the world are foolish. And it's just a different sort of mindset. So helping people understand. And, and in that first group, we had, we assigned people different things that they don't do now. Mm -hmm. They're, they, they're in completely different roles. That first group of people, uh, some of them are on staff in completely different roles than they started in. Some of them are volunteers in completely different roles. Some of them are in the same stuff. Uh, some of them started out leading and now they're, they're maybe uh, they're on staff, but they're not leading because leadership wasn't their gift. They don't enjoy it. And even if they did enjoy it, they may not be good at it, mm -hmm. but we're still serving on the team in some way together in relationship for the glory of God. And that's what it looks like. So as a team, you take what you got. Right. Well, just like your wrestling analogy. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can do the, uh, you can play a position that you're not comfortable with for a period of time if it means the, uh, it's a kingdom win. But uh, if, you, if you hold on to anything too long, uh, it's it's anti it's anti New Testament. You know, you you were talking about Philip. I Paul's story itself. You know, he he a lot of times would have an agenda. And now he's shipwrecked, or I'm going to go do this. Now he's in prison, mm -hmm. and um, now of course you know hindsight's twenty twenty. We can see that God used his prison time mightily because otherwise we wouldn't have a good chunk of the new testament yeah if he's not in jail he's not writing that's exactly right he's making an impact with people but those people are all gone and now what we have is uh him battling with the churches and trying to get them in alignment uh good thing churches don't need that today yeah. the similar alignment well and it, you know if you go back to um this it, again it, what typically happens we use the analogy of if you have uh uh, I think it was uh, John Maxwell who actually said this. I read one of his books years ago, and he said, if the senior pastor is a seven-level leader, mm -hmm. then that means on your team, everybody will be six or below mm -hmm. because he's the, he's the top. He's the cap, right? That's the, that's the ceiling. Why? Because... Typically, the senior pastor or whoever the leader is isn't going to invite people who are more equipped. They they get threatened. They're gonna they're gonna see people who see things differently as the enemy. So it it ends up being the cap. Whereas, if you understand your job is to equip people, and it's not to have an A player but an A team, and a good leader sees their own gaps sees the strengths of others, brings them onto the team so that we as a whole team uh, get to rise higher because of who you put on the mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. uh, this is important. So if you, you know, if you start out and you're a level four leader, but that's the best we have, you know, you're, you're a children's ministry person, you're a level four leader, you can handle this to a specific level. We say, hey, God's got a plan for you. I need you to step into this for right now, even though it might be scary, uh, God's going to help us do it. As time goes by, the Lord may bring us a five, a six, a seven, and we'll just keep uh, putting people who are in higher levels of leadership gifting and capability mm -hmm. into that role. Now, again, I'm not going to put them in that role if they have a like a seven or eight organizational ability, but their character is a three or four. Right, right. It's got to be that their maturity in Christ is is revealed by their submission to a three or four for a period of time. And then as we see their capabilities and their maturity grow, the, the four level leader doesn't get threatened, isn't upset. They're like, hey, I can come in underneath that person or I can go in a different role where I might be better served right now. Where does the team need me? Because it's a it's a team win. Mm -hmm. It's a God win. And we want God to bring people mm -hmm. who help us achieve more and grow more, especially as we multiply and as we uh, you know, we have multiple services and we have multiple campuses and multiple church plants. Uh, we're continuing to grow here, but we're also producing people that can help us grow uh, around the world. And again, it always starts with faithful people who are willing to, you know, we talk about fat, you know, faithful, available, teachable. Mm -hmm. And and then even then, there are levels of leadership and capability that will cap them mm -hmm. for a time. But again, that doesn't mean they're less people that it means that they, they go into a different role for a time and then they may have to come back uh, because somebody moves on and we go, but, but again, we move where we move for the glory of God and for the good of the team. So uh, to even add more complication to it though, and because since we've lived through this or been, been a witness to it, there's the individual and then there, uh, regardless of who the leader is, you know, you, you said level, level four, level five, uh, the leader can be an excellent leader, but it doesn't matter who the leader is. They still have some kind of a limp. They still have a yeah. part of their game that is less. That's one part of it. The second part of it is uh, the environment itself changes as you grow and it completely changes the playing field. And so that puts even more pressure uh, on the, basically the, the, the dam that's holding all the water 
more and more people and it changes the complexity of the organization. It puts more pressure on those weak points of the leader. How have you recruited to help that in for you as we've grown and changed over the years? Well, first of all, there, there has to be a level of self-awareness. And the only way there can be a real level of self-awareness is if you have an environment where the people around you are honest. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I have to go, okay, I have my weaknesses. I don't have to be perfect. In fact, I can't be. I'm not even sure what they are all the time. I'm so used to me that I, I'm, you know, you, you've heard the, the term nose blind, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you ever get in a person's truck or whatever, and it just stinks. There's something rotten in that truck, but the guy who's driving it doesn't smell it because he's so used to it. Right. It takes somebody else who's honest, you know, to go, hey, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here, but it stinks in here a little bit in this area. You have to create an environment where you learn to know who you really are, and it's okay but at the same time, God brings people around you. Mm -hmm. I mean, even think about marriage. You know, you, we, we need to help me. Here's what mm -hmm. that means. Every guy, you need help. Mm -hmm. you, you're not, you know, your wife was given to you to help you fill in the gaps as you raise your children. Mm -hmm. It's the same in a church. I have gaps. Am I aware of my gaps? Am I okay? I mean, it doesn't mean I'm not going to try to grow in my gaps, but there are some people that absolutely love what I, it, it is a lot of hard work and I have to make myself do constantly. And they're going to be better at it because of how they're shaped than I am. And that's good. God meant this to be a team thing mm -hmm. and it, to fill in positions in the body that, that you don't necessarily always enjoy and uh, you're not very good at. And so... There is this tension of going, I'm weak in an area. I can't use that as an excuse not to get better and just right. focus on where I like. We all need to grow up. But at the same time, there comes a time and a place where you need somebody who is better at that than you are. And now you not only see it, you put them at, in that position and you value it. Because what happens is, is they're going to be pushing on an area that's not comfortable for you and... It, it, and so when it's not comfortable, we can go, well, it must not be godly. It must not be, you know, spiritual because it's not comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. And we can pull this whole, well, God's just going to bless us in spite of this. And it's true. God blesses you in spite of it. But he also brings people to you to help you fill in that gap for the good of the whole team. Mm -hmm. So there's a tension there um, as we go through this going, I don't have to like it to do it. Right. And I should grow. I don't just do what I like to do. I do what I don't. I lose my life for the Lord's sake and I find it. But at the same time, we are a part of the body and God does bring people to help us achieve that together. And I have to notice that I need them, look for those kinds of people, invite them in and value, value their opinion rather than see, it as, see them as our enemy. How do we both see each other? You're missing part of it that I fill. I'm missing part of it that you fill. And together, we're going to uh, be a better team. But once again, it highlights the importance of uh, humility in leadership. Without it, you, you, you're you not going to get an honest opinion. Uh, without it, you're not going to make changes. And that's the end of it. And without humility, you're not going to ask for other people to get on your team. Yeah, I, I wrote a book a few years ago. It was the hardest book I've ever wrote. It's called A Revolutionary Disciple. Mm -hmm. And it talks about what what is a revolutionary disciple. I wrote it at a time when everybody's talking about, do we need an American revolution, another American revolution? And the word revolutionary, when you use it that way, that means this is like the new kind of disciple. It's mm -hmm. like something, if it's, a rev, if it's revolutionary, people go, oh, it's new and amazing. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it was a word play, but a revolutionary disciple is one who has humility. And it was hard for me to write because pride is a constant battle I face. Mm -hmm. um, and I think every human being struggles with pride, um, self-focused, mm -hmm. uh, even when it sounds, you know, when you're a victim and everybody's against me, it's still me focused. So how do you battle pride? God hates pride. He opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. It's a big deal. 
Well, if you don't have people that really know you and can't press into you and push on you and tell you the truth, and you've created that kind of culture, you're self-deceived and you're in danger. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there, my biggest struggles in life has usually been in part because of my own struggle with my, with my internal battle and pride. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to build around you sort of a, you know, make straight paths for your feet, you know, that, that keep like boundaries on the road, rumble strips, people who will, who love you enough to tell you the truth, who encourage you to continue to submit to authority. And, and what I mean by that is even as a leader, uh, you know, if you go to Jesus's conversation or, or Paul's conversation about the marriage, the, the husband is the head, right? Mm -hmm. And he, his job is to lead, but he starts, it starts out by saying, submit therefore one to another out of reverence for Christ. So even as a leader, I'm trying to discover my wife's needs and I'm laying down my life. I'm submitting in a sense mm -hmm. to laying down my life and using my skills for her good. So as a spiritual leader, I have to submit myself, myself to not only the Lord, but to the people in my life that have maturity in areas that I don't necessarily have yet, or, or to perspectives that, that are not something that's normal for me. Right. So I think about, we have guys on our staff who have been married a lot longer and have had kids a lot longer, who though I may be in charge, uh, you know, the final say on staff underneath the authority of the elders, they have a maturity and they see things that I don't see. And they're more right in some areas than I am. It, can I submit to what they suggest to me, even though they may not have, you know, boss authority, they still can speak for the Lord into my life and, and with the authority of the Lord in my life to, to straighten me out on subjects that I'm, I may be crooked in. Right. And, uh, and it just once again highlights uh, doing the hard thing, but it's at the risk of growth, personal growth and uh, organizational growth. Yeah. Uh, so if you uh, look at that, what that means organizationally or, or trying to build a culture, um, what, what is what does that look like, or or how do you how do you continually push into that so that continues as you grow? Well, yeah, I think for me, I mean, if you're gonna, it, it usually has to start at the top. Mm -hmm. So, is it my job to control who preaches, or is it my job to raise up preachers and then celebrate that we have a lot of preachers, and that other people can communicate better? Mm -hmm. or as well, at least, and it's not built on my personality and I control it. It's a culture where winning is team and not being threatened if somebody likes that person over this person when they preach. Um, it's in, it's celebrating that a person in a, in a, in a culture is willing to move over into a different role. Mm-hmm for the good of the team rather than climbing to a higher level of uh, positional authority. It's, it's sort of, you know, in the world it's, he would be first must be first. So right. I got to climb the corporate. I got to protect my position. It's a dog eat dog world. Right. Whereas we're, we want to celebrate people that are serving. So what does it mean to be a leader? Mm -hmm. A Christ-like leader gives up uh, even something that, you know, like Jesus left heaven to came, come down and meet a need. You know, we've got one of our executive guys right now who gave up his office. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris gave up his office because we needed an office. So now, even though he should, ha he could have the position and, you know, he could, that's what he cares about. And he's like, how do we as a team help serve those who are serving and elevate people who, who have humility? And, and so who is it? that has the influence in the church, the one who is the best at what they do or the one who's a servant and, uh, and it, thinking through those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And, and celebrating what, what Jesus would celebrate. Yeah. So if there's a person who was on staff, but now isn't on staff, mm -hmm. but is in a different role to me, that is like, 
they're volunteering now and they were on staff. They, they didn't fall into the identity was that. They did that for a time. Uh, but then maybe God brought somebody else differently or their season changed, but they're still a part of the team. And, and then, you know, that's hard. Those are hard battles to fight. Right. Internally. Internally. And, uh, and we got to celebrate those kind of things. Yeah. And, uh, and all it does is continue, like you've been saying, uh, building a culture where it's about the team. It's about the name on the front of the Jersey, not the name on the back of the Jersey. Uh, you were talking about, you were talking about feedback and I know uh, from our history together, a lot of times people will give you feedback and, and it's not necessarily about a weakness. And it, one person says something you need to change. That doesn't necessarily mean you make, you make a change. When is it? And, you, and in fact, one time I said one thing to you and you said, yeah, but they told David to stay on the wall and don't go fighting. And that didn't turn out very well for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've always kind of considered myself one of your mighty men. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think so anyways. And, uh, but th that is a great example. Those guys flat told David the wrong thing to do. He should have been how he ended there. up on the wall with Bat or on the, on the, the roof with Bathsheba. That's right. Yeah. If he's not on the wall, he's, he's not with Bathsheba. He's not with Bathsheba. It just goes downhill from there. He wasn't where God wanted him to be. God wanted him to be a warrior. And he wasn't out there in the field and his men around him told him, some erroneous. Um, You're so important. You need to go back home. Yeah. And, yeah. So uh, sometimes people tell you things that isn't necessarily true, right. but it's true from their perspective and their hearts mm -hmm. aren't bad. Right. So you hear something, you don't automatically make a change. What, what is your process if, if you hear people say their opinions or whatever? Yeah. One of the things you'll find is when you create a safe place, for people to, to share, they do. And while there are holes in your game and you need help, not everything they say is helpful. Mm -hmm. Jesus created a place for the disciples to speak. And then Peter says, you're not going to Jerusalem. We're not going to let that happen. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that Peter was Satan, but he was speaking from a different perspective. So just because you have humility doesn't mean you have to listen to what everybody has to say. There has to be uh, first, God's word is God's word. So if it comes contrary to God's word, it's not being led by the Holy Spirit. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's true. So you have to have some wise counsel that you can work through stuff with. Um, sometimes they say something personal, like, you know, you're, I perceive that you're arrogant or you're one of those things. And then you have to go, you, you know, okay, if I'm going to be open, is that a possibility? Yes. Does that mean that's true in this case? Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And you have to have people around you that, that you can go to and go, Hey, somebody just said this and you have to be, you have to be, um, fair in what they said. So you don't paint it so that you get the answer that right, you want. Right. It's somebody just said this, this is what happened. Is that how you perceive me to be? Is that who, who you think I am? And, and you had, so having a relationship with the elders where they really know you with your staff, you and I, I've, I've bounced things off of you for years. I have, you know, other folks on staff that I've done that for years with and going, do you think that's right? This is their perspective. And, and you guys really know that I want the Lord's will on this. So sometimes you've said, well, let me pray about that. Let me think about that. Mm -hmm. And there've been times you're like, you know, I can see how they would say that. That, that might be true in this case. There are times where you, you guys have gone, no, that's not you. Yeah, and I don't think that's correct for this reason. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have people that you've created a safe environment with, and you have to actually make it safe by, by asking. But at the same time, just because I'm, I've got staff that are no longer here because they thought that we had done something wrong or that I didn't agree with them, therefore I wasn't listening. Mm -hmm. No, I, I heard you. And I, I just didn't listen to you because you said, I went to some other people that may don't, you know, you may be saying that because you have some sort of reason why this benefits you or hurts you in some way. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you may not be seeing the forest for the trees. But at the same time, if I can get somebody who's not in the emotional fray of the situation and, and go, no, I don't think that's right. I think this is right. Uh, and it, now I can bounce it off of people who feel safe. We can go to God's word. We can pray about it. So in, as, in a sense, you have to have 
tough skin, but a, but a soft heart. Mm -hmm. That's good. And uh, you're going to hear things that aren't true. How do you work through whether they are or not? And you have to go, okay, who am I in Christ? It's okay if I'm wrong. Right. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. That doesn't mean I'm wrong right. in this case. And, I, and I'm not sure. So I've got people around me, my wife, I have a counselor is on my speed dial. Mm -hmm. I've got friends because it's possible for me to be off course. And I want to hear what God has to say to me. And he does speak through people, but he doesn't always speak through every person. Mm -hmm. So that is a super important piece to all of this. And once again, the answer is relationship. Yeah. Uh, appreciate your wise counsel today on a very difficult topic, which is recruiting and uh, and realigning people in to win and be a championship team, which is so important. And as we continue this conversation, we appreciate your questions. Uh, please continue to email us. We'll continue to answer them. In fact, we have one for next week, and I'm excited about it. That is uh, in Chapter 7 is of Church's Team Sport, you uh, come up with the phrase watering hole, but it's in reference to Sunday morning. And I think you and your view on Sunday morning is completely different than uh, a lot of the pastors I've ever been around for sure. And we're going to get into that and uh, one of the many purposes of what Sunday morning is for. Mm -hmm.